Matthew chapter 2. We will begin reading in verse 1 and read through verse 12, and Lord willing, look at the entirety of those verses together this morning. Let's give our attention to the reading of God's inspired, authoritative, and holy word. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. In assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense, and myrrh, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And Father, we desire now to give our attentions particularly to your word. We desire, Father, to have them opened unto us, not only in the books and pages before us, but to have an understanding of them opened unto us within our very hearts and minds. We desire, Father, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to understand all that you have in your word concerning what you desire for your people to believe concerning you, what duties you require of us. Father, would you help us to heed the warnings in your word? Would you help us to rejoice at the good news that we find Therein, Father, would you help us to respond in proper obedience to what your word commands of us? Would you teach us, Father, by your spirit to do that out of a proper response of love for Jesus Christ, who he is, what he has done, and all that that means for us? We ask it in his name. Amen. As I told the kids in last week's sermon... I asserted that the birth of Jesus carried with it an implication that we must reckon with Christ. Now, our abilities and our willingnesses to reckon with items of significance often occur across a very broad range. Here's what I mean. Some of us like to respond immediately. Others of us, like myself, get to it when we get to it. Some respond with, with, a, with a hesitancy to what it is that is in front of us. Others respond with, with an eagerness for what it is that we have before us to do. Some of us respond joyfully. Some of us respond begrudgingly. You, you get the general idea. Now, most likely, we've all done all of these at one time or another, depending on our personalities, depending on, depending on what the thing of significance in front of us particularly was. And I would hope that there's been a difference between maybe the way that you've thought of paying your personal property taxes and the way you think of buying an anniversary present. If there's not a distinction between the way you think of those things, you can go ahead and schedule your marriage counseling with me as soon as, as service is over, and I'd be happy to oblige. There's a difference in the way that we think about these things, depending on us, depending on the thing itself, and depending on how we respond particularly to it. Well, the passage before us today in Matthew chapter 2, very much like the passage last week in Matthew chapter 1, puts before us Jesus Christ. 
And he puts him before us in an almost assumed sort of way. Much like last week, Matthew doesn't get bogged down in the details of arguing of the reality of whether or not Jesus was actually born. He actually was. It's almost historically and intellectually foolish to assert that somebody named Jesus never existed. And so Matthew understands this and moves right into it. He he does this within verse 1 when he says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king... You get the idea. He just moves right into it. But he does give us a particular historical indicator in the days of Herod the king so that we actually have a time frame in which to place this actual occurrence that happened. Now, I'm not going to redevelop my argumentation for the reality of of Jesus or the reality of who he is. That was all done last week. This week, rather, what I want to focus on is what this passage puts before us, namely four particular ways that Jesus is reckoned with. And so as we work our way through this passage, that's what we're going to see. Four particular ways that Jesus is reckoned with. First, Jesus gets reckoned with hostility. Next, we'll see how He is reckoned with through ingratitude. Then we'll look at how He is reckoned with through indifference. And then lastly, we will see how Jesus is reckoned with through reverence. Hostility, ingratitude, indifference, and reverence. Now, I have to give you kind of an introduction 2.0. Bear with me. Because in the opening verse, we meet the four characters who are going to posit these four particular responses. Some of them explicitly, some of them implicitly. It says that Jesus was born in Judea. The people will provide a response. Likewise, their chief priests and scribes will provide a response. These are the implicit points in there. Thirdly, Herod will will have something to say about this idea of Jesus being born in Bethlehem of Judea. And then lastly, we'll see a response from these wise men. But particularly it is, as we see in verse 1, the coming of these wise men that serves as the catalyst for all this that is about to take place. Our text tells us that they came from the east. Their title, combined with their origin, verifies their identity. It was common for Eastern religions to be immersed in astrology. Now, now some of you, because you've heard many Christmas sermons, maybe you've heard that the, the word behind this phrase or title for wise men, and there's even a footnote in some of your Bibles, is the Greek uh, magi. Literally, it's, it's magoi is what it says here. And we've derived a word from that, the word for magic. And so sometimes we'll read back into this and go, oh, they were magicians. Well... They weren't exactly pulling bunnies out of hats. And they weren't exactly going to, 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 to Green, or Grindelwald to, to buy a wand. It's not that kind of particular magic. No, these were astrologers. These were, these were men who spent time observing the stars and the skies and their patterns and how they move. And as we'll see today, any, particularly, any particular anomalies and anything that took place therein. Nevertheless... This presence in Jerusalem by these wise men, these these magi, would have been odd. They possibly would have even been unwelcome in the area in which they had come. Now verse 2 gives us the reason for their journey, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. They come in search of a king. But not just any king, the one who has been born king of the Jews. And what has brought then on this journey but a star? The very thing they spend their time observing and looking at, a star has brought them on this journey. Now notice how they refer to the star. It was a star in the east or a star when it rose. This particular observation of the star raises a lot of questions. Is this an actual star with some phenomenal occurrence surrounding it? Some people have tried to posit that this is Halley's Comet and a number of other particular creative ways to explain what this is. But I tend to side, this is going to really shock you, I tend to side with the majority conservative reform scholars and commentators on this particular thing. That this was not Halley's Comet or, or some other natural occurrence but rather a supernatural phenomenon put in place by the sovereign hand of the sovereign God of the universe who created all the stars and put them into place to 
begin with, who created this phenomenon for a particular purpose. He uses the occupation of these wise men to draw them to this Christ that Matthew assumes he puts forward here. Now I want you to picture Herod, who we meet also in this first verse. He's comfortable, probably, in his palace. That's usually how we picture kings, right? They're comfortable. Although there's a lot of responsibility that comes with being a king, so was he always comfortable? I don't know. Possibly he's had to recently deal with a few family conflicts. If you study the Herods, there's a lot of family conflict built in, especially this particular one. Fun fact, he doesn't live many years past this particular occurrence. He's dead within like three to four years of all this happening, which makes his fears a little bit silly, to be honest with you. But nevertheless, he's resting from his work and Word has come to him of this grand caravan of men from the east that have come in. Contrary to the popular Christmas hymn, there's not merely three of them here. One, the text never particularly indicates that. Trying to develop that idea from the fact that there there are three gifts is just silly for all kinds of reasons. And more than that, that just isn't simply how this type of individual would have traveled in small groups of two or three. No, most likely this is a grand procession of a large group of men of this particular uh, occupation and even probably some of their servants and people around them to come in to do this act of finding this Jesus, finding this king of the Jews, and particularly coming to worship him. They come to Herod and they want to know where is the one who has been born king of the Jews. And Herod begins to kind of run through his Rolodex of family conflicts and how many sons he had killed that week. Probably counts how many sons he has left. Then he has to go and check with his many wives and see, have I had any sons born recently that I've forgotten about? And lo and behold, he realizes, well, no son has been born in my house. And wait a minute, I'm the king of the Jews. What? Thus, the conflict of the passage is put right in front of us because it's not Herod that the wise men seek. And it's not one of Herod's sons that the wise men seek, but it is our very Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one of whom I posit to you again has to be reckoned with. Now Herod, having come to this realization now, has to respond. Herod has to reckon with Jesus. And how does Herod reckon with Jesus? Well, Herod provides our first point. He reckons with Jesus with hostility. Verse 3 reads that when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Now, this same word in almost the same form is used in Matthew chapter 14 whenever the disciples are fishing and a great storm comes and they look out across the sea and what do they see but what they think is a ghost walking up to them. And The text says that they were troubled or very afraid. That's the sense that that Herod has here whenever this caravan comes in. He is troubled. He is terrified. He is afraid. Why is that? Well, also, if you look into the Herods, what you begin to realize is their position was just a little bit bogus. They were kind of there to appease the Jews, to allow the Jews to think that they had a Jewish king that was ruling over them, not actually Caesar. They, they, They are put there so that the Jews think that they're still in control even though they still have to go through all sorts of hoops to jump through to be able to perform their particular Jewish worship. But we won't get into that. You see, Herod knows in the true depths of his being that he's a fraud. He also knows that, that conflict tends to follow him everywhere that he goes. I've already referenced the problems that he has within his household. But fear here is merely the emotion. And people respond differently to the emotion of fear. If you need to see that, you can just come hang out at my house sometime. Herod out of this fear, has now a desire for more information about the validity of the claim of these wise men, that they've come to worship this one who's born king of the Jews. And so in verse 4, he begins to gather this information. He gathers together the priests and the scribes of the people and inquires of them where this Christ is to be born. Now, how did he know that they were referring to Christ? Did you catch the chat? Nowhere here do the wise men use the name Christos. It's the Greek word for Christ. They talk about him who's been born king of the Jews, but there's a different word for king than there is for Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. You see, Herod appears to have made an assumption here. Now, why would he 
do that. You see, Herod was no imbecile. Kings in those days were capable, learned men. The wise men did not need to specify or mention Jesus. For Herod, when they heard, when he heard what they were there to do, there were really just two options. These are either, either the crazed ramblings of Eastern pagans or the Messiah that all of the Jewish scriptures prophesied of has actually been born, in which case he has to be reckoned with. Now, if Messiah has been born, Herod's reign is definitely coming to an end. Perhaps the, the wise men and Herod were both familiar with Balaam's third oracle in Numbers chapter 24. In verse 17 of that oracle, he says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. For those of you that don't know, Balaam is the unexpected Gentile prophet of God's people in Numbers chapter 24. He was of pagan origin, much the same as these wise men are, possibly from the exact same area. Some of that is speculation, but some of that is just historical fact. That's who he is. It wouldn't be crazy to assume that they might actually know who Balaam was and actually know what it was that he said. So this then leads him, having learned where Christ would be, if he had been truly born, asking them, when had the star appeared? and then sending them to find the child. Now, the reason for that is going to become more clear next week. Why does he want to know when the child was born? We'll see. Then he can ascertain how old the child was. He knows probably about how long they had been traveling. Either they had told him that, or he just knows his geography very well. If he knows when the star was seen, he can do the math and figure out about how old the child is. Therefore, he knows how old babies that are of a certain age need to be to be killed. We're going to talk more about that next week. And he lies in verse 8, verse 8, and he says that his reason or his intent for sending them out is that he might worship them. I have the same intentions that you do. I want to do the same thing that you want to do. I want to worship him. Quick applicational note is that much, not much the same way of the lies of this world whenever we are told or maybe even we tell others that we have the same intent with regard to love or to worship or to service or to kindness, or whatever it is that we want to put out there to assume that we actually have the same agenda. When we do that, we're just like Herod. But we later learn that he doesn't intend to worship at all. What he intends to do is to kill. Herod reckons with Jesus through hostility. Now, here's the question that we have to ask before we move to the next point. Are you Herod? Do you react to Christ with hostility? Do you have rage that boils up within you at the very thought of Him and and who He is and what it is that He claims to come to do? What about when you hear it said that His coming calls for you to repent of your sins and trust in Him? How do you feel then? Is it rage? Is it anger? Is it hostility that raises up in you? Do you love your sin too much to heed the call of Christ? Trust in Him, to repent of your sins, to reckon properly with Him? Do you find yourself seeking measures to avoid what it is that He is calling you to do? So, you are no different than Herod. Now, the next way that we see Jesus reckoned with, in the same way that we see it in not only our text but the world as well, is in gratitude. Verse 3 says that not only was Herod troubled, but also all Jerusalem with him. Now, I get that the text doesn't say anything else about all of Jerusalem, but there is, believe it or not, enough information here for us to work with. Indeed, what affects the king affects the people. It's pretty simple. However, though they experience the same feeling of fear as Herod did, their position results in a different response in light of it. In other words, what I mean is this. They're not a group of a bunch of kings whose reign is about to be overthrown. So while the text clearly tells us they feel the same emotion, they're also troubled in their hearts. Naturally, logically, the response is going to be different. Calvin makes this observation. He says that either they were simply stirred up by the, by the pomp and circumstance of all of it, or they were troubled by the reality 
of the potential change in order, the shifting of the guard, if you will. Again, you may be surprised, but I tend to agree with John Calvin on this particular point, though the two may be likely related. Because isn't it fascinating how little we can be satisfied with? I want you to think about the people. These are, remember, Herod's the the, the Jewish king, Israelite's king. He's the people's king in Jerusalem. He's supposed to uphold their religion, their traditions, their worship. That's part of his job. He's their king. And it's him being in place that that serves as sort of the the bridge that allows them under Roman rule to continue to worship the way that they feel they need to, the way actually that they're supposed to. If Herod is about to be dethroned, all of that changes. My way of living life is about to change. My way of doing things is about to change. The things that I've grown very used to and accustomed to are about to change. There's a shifting happening here. And no matter how many times somebody might scream in your ear that this change is going to be good, this is for your good, you need this change, what do we do whenever change is spoken of to us? Uh, Don't like that. Perfectly happy with the way things are. Don't need your help, thanks. I want you to wrap your mind around this. These people are perfectly content having a fraud for their ruler simply so they can continue in their rituals and traditions that they had grown accustomed to under the particular governmental order under which they had become accustomed to them. Do you you get that? Is it starting to sound silly to you? I hope so. And I hope you see that we do the same thing. We oftentimes respond much the same way. It's fascinating how little we're satisfied with. It is equally fascinating how quickly we can shift from disapproval with something Truly displeasing to content of the worst kind, even satisfaction with it, to the point that we become troubled at the thought of the thing that we are originally dissatisfied with that now that we've become comfortable with, ending. Ever done that? Ever thought you weren't going to like something? Maybe even in hindsight, you shouldn't have ever liked it to begin with. But somehow, some way, you've become to like it. And now all of a sudden, the idea of it not being there simply terrifies you in case I'm not doing a very good job. Maybe C.S. Lewis can explain this better. You're very familiar with this quote, I hope. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slums but it's because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a day at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Is that true of you? Are you far too easily pleased? Perhaps you're exactly what Lewis describes. You are too happy with your current worldly pleasures and circumstances to respond appropriately to who this Christ is and what he has done. Or maybe you've gotten really good at this Christian thing. So good that you're fool, that you fooled everyone else for so long but you've now moved on into fooling yourself because fooling other people has just become a little bit too easy. You read your Bible, but you're rather ignorant of the commands that it contains for you. You pray, but it's usually for everybody else that needs to get their stuff together, not for you and your sin. You come to church, but you come to grumble and to complain rather than to be lifted up by the very means of grace that have been given to you. You speak of your faith, but you can't be bothered with it before 1045 or afternoon on Sunday. You speak of peace, but but really what you mean is complacency and license to be spiritually lazy. Now, if that's you, if you are responding to this Christ, you are reckoning with this Christ with ingratitude, all I can do is put the truth before you and plead with you to repent of your ingratitude. 
repent of the inappropriate way with which you are responding to this Christ, who He is and what it is that He has done. Now, the third way that Christ gets reckoned with in our text and in our experiences is not completely unlike ingratitude, but it's subtly different. And that's simply indifference. You see, verse 4 said that, that Herod gathered the priests and the scribes to tell him where the Christ would be born. Do you realize who these are? These are the religious elite. These are the theological giants. Most likely, most commentators agree that, that the, the chief priests would, would have made up the Sadducees. They're the theological progressives of the group. They, they deny the resurrection and a few other key things. Whereas the scribes, those are those you know, Bible-loving Jewish Presbyterians of the day. They were all about what the Word said and the truths of the fine letter of the law. And these two groups oftentimes couldn't get along with one another. But Herod calls both of them in and asks them what would have been basically a simple but down third baseline theological question regarding their particular Bible knowledge. If your entire life had been summarized by this, by, by who this Christ is, think about this, these are the Old Testament experts. And you and I know that all of the Old Testament points to Jesus, Right? Their whole life is bound up in studying and knowing these texts. Now, if your life was summarized by this in that way, as it was for these men, don't you think that you would exuberantly respond at at this particular news? Don't you think you'd get a little bit excited? Don't you think you would be pumped to hear what it is that Herod is telling you has happened? Don't you think that you'd be telling all of those people within the city who are freaking out because the shifting of the guard is about to occur to say, calm down, this is really good news. This is what we've been looking for. This is what we've been waiting for. You see, these men seem to be simply content in passing their Bible exams and going about their business. Let's take a look at their answer. They believe the accuracy of the prophecy from Micah 5, despite their differences. That they can agree on. Yes, that is talking about the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. But in their agreement of what it says and in their agreement of what it means, they they miss so much. They miss so much. You see, they miss the graces that are in this text. We read it earlier in our Assurance of Pardon and in I won't turn there and read it again. But if you wanted to go read Micah 5, 2 through 5 sometime, this is what you would find. That there in the least is actually not the least. Bethlehem, the little bitty podunk town that nobody was really all that familiar with, is where the Messiah, the Christ, is born. They miss that the true ruler has come. They miss the fact that it's the fraud that called them in to answer the, to ask the question. And that their answer to him actually means that his reign is done. It's over. The substance of the shadow he's pointing to has actually come. They miss that the God of the universe has come. It doesn't take a theological expert to read the Old Testament and see that when the Messiah is pointed to, he is indeed divine. This is not just some dude that's born somewhere. This is God in the flesh. They miss that the true shepherd has come. These wayward people, these confused people, these lost people, these people that are like a sheep without a shepherd, their shepherd has come. And he's come particularly to shepherd them. And lastly, they miss that the fullness of peace has come. From Babylonian captivity to under Roman rule, don't you think they would love nothing more than to be able to get out from underneath all of that? But yet at the announcement that the one who comes to usher that in and make that happen, the one on whom the government will be on his shoulders and of the increase of peace, there will be no end. Yeah, Micah 5.2 says that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Anything else I can do for you today, Herod? And they're out the back door. Yet, we hear this as nothing more than an assertion of biblical fact. Not only are we ungrateful, we are simply 
indifferent. Many of us become just like the church at Laodicea that John's going to write to later in Revelation, becoming lukewarm to the point that God intends to spew them out of His mouth. Indifferent to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Indifferent to the reality that you are a ruined, wretched, wretched, unrighteous sinner. Indifferent to the reality that despite your sin, the second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, who was God and is was with God, has come to save you out of your darkness and to save you from your sin. He has come to pay for all of the sins that you have committed. He has come to pay for all of the debt that you owe to Almighty God. For the cosmic treason that you have committed, God has come in the flesh to pay that debt for you. And all he does is he simply calls you to repent of your sin and to trust in him, to stop trying to fix your own problems and to look to him, to stop with being content with the ways of this world and to look to him, to stop walking in the way of that old man, to put it off and to look to him. This is what he calls you to, and we respond to it with indifference. We don't care. We're over it. We've memorized the Lord's Prayer. We've memorized the Ten Commandments. We've memorized our catechism. We know a handful of Bible verses, and we're done. We'll come here. We'll do our Sunday thing. Other than that, please leave me alone. We, just like the chief priests and the scribes, have grown cold, indifferent, lukewarm to the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it sounds silly when I get all worked up and passionately put that out there to you like that. It sounds so silly, but that's what we do. That's what we do. So, if responding with hostility is wrong, you do get that right. If responding with ingratitude is wrong, I hope you got that. If responding with indifference is antithetical to the reality of what the gospel is, I hope you got that. The question that is begged, what is the proper way to reckon with Jesus. Reverence. Reverence. We find in these wise men the only proper response to the coming of Jesus Christ. Reverent worship. Reverent worship. They announced that this was their very purpose All the way back in verse 2, we have come to worship Him. Their journey was confirmed as valid when the same star that brought them from the east appears again now and guides them to where Christ is. Did you catch that? In verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. That's why I say that the star was a supernatural phenomenon, a miracle that God and His sovereignty put into place, because it becomes very evident and clear that the star has a purpose, to lead them to Jesus Christ. That is its purpose. And look with me at verse 10 when this star does that. I want you to get your head around this. These are pagan sorcerers, ancient astrologers. They are well-versed in many things. In addition to the way that the stars are patterned and work and move and the things that happen in the sky, they apparently also are pretty well-versed in historical ancient religious texts as well. And upon seeing the star, they've been able to connect these dots and put all of these things together, and they decide that it would be a good idea to take a a year-and-a-half, two-year journey from Babylon to Bethlehem. That's what this meant to them. And apparently somewhere along the way, the star stopped. They they followed it to where it was, but they don't have sight of it anymore. They find themselves in Jerusalem, so they begin asking questions. That's what gets all the people in an uproar. That's what brings it to Herod's account. That's what creates his hostile response. That's what leads to him then calling and asking the chief priests and the scribes to come in. That's what leads to their indifference. And, and, And you think about these pious pagans, if I can put it that way, who are coming to worship this Christ... They are watching the reactions of the people that should be responding the way that they are, and they're probably getting a little confused. 
this guy doesn't seem too happy at the reality that this has happened. These people seem scared out of their wits. Those guys just don't care. They want to go back to copying Old Testament text. They're looking then for that awkward way out. I got, I got to get out of here. This wasn't what I was expecting. I thought you guys would be happy. The star reappears, and it takes them to the place where the child was. And verse 10 says, When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. probably don't have time to teach you the Greek you need to know to understand the weight that is behind what that says. I mean, our English translators have done the best that they could possibly do, but I want you to get this. This is a seriously deep-rooted, joyful response, not just to some star. You understand, these guys aren't just excited at their occupation. Somehow, we know how, God's grace, they've become able to understand what it means, where it's taking them, what it's pointing to, what it's all about. And they respond with exceedingly great joy. How do they respond to this news of Christ coming, to this news of Christ, who Christ is, and more than that, but to the news that they're going to be guided to Him? They rejoice. They worship. Verse 11 tells us that they offer gifts going into the house. They saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down, worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Some commentators want to do some work with the meaning of those gifts. Indeed, gold would have been a gift fit for a king. Frankincense most likely was used in religious worship as as incense in, in temple worship. And myrrh was used to anoint dead bodies so that they wouldn't stink. And so people want to posit here that this points to Christ being a king, Christ being a priest, and the reality that Christ has come for the very purpose of dying for the sins of his people. I don't know that that's necessarily the wise men intent. I don't know that that's necessarily Matthew's intent. But it is true nonetheless. The true king has indeed come. He indeed is our true priest who shepherds us. Malachi has already taught us that. And the way that he is going to do that baffles us. How do you think a king is going to come and rule over you? How do you think a priest would guide and direct you? Apparently the only right way to do it is to come and to die for you. That's what this king priest did. He came and he died. These wise men are prepared to respond to this with rejoicing, with worship, with the offering of gifts. And then in light of their faithfulness and in light of the purposes of God Almighty in verse 12, they are guided and protected by this God who has brought them to this point. Being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Ought we not to respond the same way as they do? What makes more sense to you? Your hostility or reverence? Your ingratitude or reverence. Your indifference, or reverence. What makes more sense? The text, at least to me, is clear. The truth of all of Scripture seems to me to be quite clear. Hostility and gratitude, indifference, are no way to respond to the truths of this God who has come to save His people from their sins. No. No, we should rejoice in the coming of Christ. We should seek to worship reverently through Christ. We should offer gifts of generosity in faith because of Christ. We should allow ourselves to be guided and protected by the very Spirit of Christ. Because the reality of the matter is, God is still, this very day, leading those whom He would call by the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, through His blood and the urging of the Holy Spirit, He is still, to this very day, leading them to Christ. And He is still, to this very day, doing it in ways that baffle our minds, that just don't make sense to us. Because how is He doing it? But He draws men and women into places of worship, 
to hear the truths of this gospel proclaimed week in and week out. He offers in his church water sprinkled on his elect for the remission of their sins. He offers bread broken, wine poured out to symbolize a body broken and blood shed and poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. These are what we call the means of grace. I know you want a star. I know you want some supernatural phenomenon to appear in the sky. But you know what you got? You got a bearded dude who God in his providence has brought to proclaim these truths to you week in and week out. You know what you got? You got a font filled with water to remind you of your being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You know what you have? You have a table that is laid here for you where the body of Christ is broken and the blood of Christ is shed. And that gospel is declared to you week in and week out. You've been brought to a community of people who have been called by the same Jesus Christ to participate in prayer and fellowship with these saints. That's what you've got. That is what Jesus is using to draw people to himself. How will you respond? Will you remain hostile, ungracious, and indifferent? Or will you respond with reverent repentance and faith? That's what's before you each and every week. Father, would you use your means of grace to continue to draw people to your Son, Jesus Christ? Will you use the preaching of Christ to draw people to Him? Would you use the baptism of Christ to draw people to Him? Would you use the body of Christ broken and the blood of Christ shed and laid bare at this table for us to draw people to Him? Would you use the work of of the communion of saints to draw people to Christ? Would you call sinners to repentance? Would you call the church who has become hostile, ungracious, and indifferent to repent of her sin of lukewarmness and to turn back again to Christ and to worship Him with an exceedingly great joy as the only proper response to who Jesus is? Father, would you do this? glory of your name and for the good of your people. We pray it in Christ. Amen.